Empire. Hello and welcome to my podcast. Do me a favor, subscribe to the John Con Report wherever you get your podcasts. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. You can find us there as part of Empire Media, A-M-P-I-R-E. Always much appreciated when you tune in, especially when you hear my voice like this. So I appreciate you putting up with the voice. A little bit scratchy, still a little bit under the weather and still a little bit um, whatever. So anyways, do appreciate it. And don't forget uh, at 7.30 Eastern time, Tuesday night, join me for the live stream with Bram Weinstein, the voice of commanders as we talk about what we saw from the Ravens game, but also what this loss means, how the team can build on it, or not just build on, not build on the losses, but what lessons they can they learn that they can then build upon and what, what it means for Sunday against Carolina. Don't sleep on the Panthers only because you, if you want to build, you want to become a good team. This is a game you have to win. As important as the Ravens game was, it's still only one game, just like this is only one game, but this is a big test because you're coming off a tough loss, not, but you're getting back and you had a four game winning streak snapped. You're going back home. You got to win that game. Anyway. So join me with Bram and I for that live stream. And then also for you gold members, I'll be doing the private zoom at seven 30 Eastern time on Thursday. I hope you guys, you joined me last week, enjoyed the doc Walker session. I thought that was a lot of fun. Doc is was classic doc. So anyway, join me that Thursday night, seven 30 Eastern time. So today, just my game review, I'm going to go over why some of those big plays occurred on defense. And then also some of the mastery of Jaden Daniels, at quarterback, and just the, some of the tight window throws that he made and just the placement, the accuracy that he consistently displays, it's just really impressive. And so I'm going to go over some of that too and just show you some examples, et cetera. So, but we got to start with the big news because that's John Allen. As I'm sure by now you know that he's out for the year. He tore his left pec in the, um, on this, he actually tore it on the Derrick Henry seven yard touchdown when you could kind of see him on the ground after the end of the play, rolling and grabbing his arm. I will say I saw him last night after the game and he of course said he was fine, but he had already had some tests done by that point, And he seemed, he didn't feel like it was going to be that as serious as it certainly turned out to be. And then I think even, you know, this morning, I think he was telling some people that he felt okay. But the MRI showed something different. And the MRI showed the tear in the left bicep. So they got that news. I can't remember what time it was, around 2 o'clock or so, maybe a little after. It probably actually was about 2.15-ish. And then it immediately came out. So that was just unfortunate for Allen and um, just a, a big disappointing blow to the commanders. I know he's caught a lot of criticism. You don't want to lose your starting defensive tackle. And you you know, you don't want to lose a guy who knows how to play. And was he as productive as he's been in previous years? No, he hasn't been. And neither has been De, neither has Deron Payne. However, he's still a quality, he's still a, a good starting defensive tackle. And you don't like to lose those guys because now you're dipping into your depth. Now you have to go, now you have to Darian Mathis and Johnny Newton who have to play more and play better. Then you're gonna have to find something else, someone else behind them to build onto that depth. You also have F.A. Obada who can rush inside in pass rush situations. So that certainly helps. That's one of the, that, the what's one of the benefits of Obada. And he actually had a couple of nice rushes the other day is that he's big enough. He's like 6'6", six, six, almost 270, that he can rush from inside. And, and Quinn likes to use those guys like that inside. So that's something they can do to build on that pass rush. But it remains difficult to replace a guy like Allen or short. So uh, the, the other question is, what is his future now in Washington? He has one more year left on his contract, no more guaranteed money. If they want, if they decided to cut him after the season, they can save $17 million on the salary cap. So, you know, he's been a quality player here for, since he was drafted here in 2017. Um, so you just wonder what the future would be. No, you can't trade him. Nobody's going to take a guy at that age who's coming off a torn pack. And so the question would be, do you cut him or do you keep him? Do you do anything with the deal? Whatever. So that's what they're, that's what they'll face down the road with him. He is under going to go, he is going to undergo surgery as Dan Quinn said, quote, in the coming days. 
Um, so the other, the other Dorrance Armstrong had the rib injury. Still, he was still when when we when I record this, still don't know anymore. And Quinn said he was getting more tests done. He had Javante Jean Baptiste with um, he has an ankle injury and he left the block room. I told you the other day in a, in a boot. It's a sprained ankle. Don't know the severity yet. Again, getting more tests. So we'll probably find out more about that on Wednesday. So, and then the other thing is that Quinn was asked in his press conference on one of the other things he was asked on Monday was about Emmanuel Forbes and what hasn't he done to remain active. Now, Quinn basically wrote off him being inactive to, well, the Ravens run a lot of heavy packages, which they do because they had Michael Walker, the linebacker, playing a lot more than he has in other games, not just in goal line packages. So they definitely do more of that, not as many three receiver sets. So you don't need as many corners. However, bottom line is, he was not good enough to be active, and Michael Davis was. And, I, you know, Quinn said it doesn't have anything to do with special teams. I think if he could play special teams, you you keep him active if you think he can help you at all on defense. Um, because if you're not being active, if you're not starting, you better be able to play special teams, and he just doesn't. So, anyways, there you go there. And now, um, one of the things, too, Quinn talked about on the press conference was just some things he heard in the locker room after the game that really kind of, I think, pleased him and just lets him know what the level of the maturity of this team or where the mindset is at. And then I always go back to like coming off games like this. Now, again, it wasn't, it wasn't some back and forth affair. I mean, Baltimore had control, but Washington had chances to get back in that game and certainly losing only by a touchdown, they weren't blown out. And I think they you know easily probably could have been, in if you don't have certain, you know, back before this group, I guess, before this season, I should say. So, but I think what you do is you learn the maturity of your team. Like you can't sit there and say, hey, close to a team that's a Super Bowl contender, almost had it. It's not how, I don't think this is how this group approaches it, especially when you have guys like Wagner, Ertz, et cetera. So one of the things Quinn said he heard in the locker room was, quote, we're effing going to learn from this. And that's, you know, that's, I think, something that coaches like that you want to hear the anger. You want to hear that you you need to learn from this. What do you learn from this? And as Quinn said, the question for them is, how do we, how do they improve? How do they improve? And I think, and I've told you before, I think one of the best things I've heard from this group is a consistent message of what they're looking for, the standards that they want, and they're not, they don't deviate from how they assess a win or a loss. And I think that's a good approach because it keeps you on that even keeled path to to building on whatever a win or a loss was, right? So I think that's a good thing. Um, so there you go. And the other one of the other things that Quinn talked about was how the coverage and the rush need to work more together. They play more man coverage this game. The pass rush didn't get home. If you're going to play man, it better get home on the pass rush. Now the, you're playing man, so you can disrupt things a little bit more, and maybe run some games or whatever. Well, they did, They weren't getting home. In fact, like I know uh, Benjamin St. Juice gets blamed for a lot of things, and he gave up a 23-yard pass to Zay Flowers on a crosser. Well, you know how much time he had the Jackson, Lamar Jackson had before he threw it? Three, it was 3.6 seconds before he released the ball. You're not, they're not, St. Juice is not going to cover Zay Flowers for 3.6 seconds. So that's a tough matchup. If you're going to play man, you've got to have those guys – do a better job of making Jackson get uncomfortable in the pocket. And that's one of the things I'm curious to see, whether it's Obata, you know, more so Johnny Newton, but can Obata help them as an inside rusher? We'll see. I think Johnny Newton at times shows some things for sure. I just, I keep saying to him, for me with him, it's a matter of experience and what does he do once he gets there and knows how to use the talent that he does have. So the big plays, Baltimore had 13 plays that gained 15 yards or more. That's for, I think it was 311 of their 484 yards came on 13 plays. That's not good. So, and part of that is Quinn said they left themselves vulnerable because they were so intent on trying to stop Derrick Henry and Lamar Jackson in the run game. For the first half, they did a pretty good job with that. Baltimore had like, I think, 51 yards rushing at halftime. Not for the game. And but they left themselves vulnerable to some breakdowns in coverage or plays I just described, like St. Juiced. You know, could he have played that one better? Yeah, but you can't give someone like that 
three point. They don't have guys that are going to stop guys from when there's three point six seconds to throw. So that's one of the things that that Quinn talked about, and you know they did leave themselves vulnerable. And I know you know the I know St. Juice is going to get picked on a lot. He had the two penalties. I did think the first the first one. I thought they were both kind of. I thought the first one. I'm not sold that he really impeded the progress that impeded the receiver at all. And I thought the second one was the receiver was kind of seemed to be falling down coming out of his break. So you can process it however you want. Bottom line is they were called. So that's, that's what we know. But the other thing is, what I'm going to say is I know he gets a lot of flack for things. And it's the problem is it's, you know, the lot of the issues the other day weren't really about him. Um, not, I mean, there were certainly things that, that he did that um, he could have been more clean about with, again, the leverage or a couple of plays he could have played better. Absolutely. So, I'm, And this is not to absolve him. It's to say the problems are more widespread than just that. And I think you do know that. So I'm going to give you guys a lot of credit and say, I think you guys understand that. So um, there's a combination of factors. And yes, there was some miscommunications in zone coverages or just some looks that that Baltimore threw at them that caused them to have those miscommunications, whether it's late motion or whatever. Um, there were sometimes it's a drop by the line. Sometimes it's where the linebacker is dropping in coverage. Are they getting to the right landmark? You know, that's, I think sometimes you wonder about that too. Those things can be cleaned up. The more you work on that, the more you drill it, you can clean that stuff up because that's a, that's more mental than it is physical. If you're just getting beat because you're not fast enough, we've seen some of those, then you that's an issue, right? You know, but if you're getting beat because you're not getting to the right area or maybe you read the play wrong, that's something that you can clean up. So, for example, there was a 25-yard pass to Mark Andrews, if you remember this one. So, excuse me, it wasn't to Mark Andrews. It was to, oh, man, now I forget who that was to. Um, it was a deep crosser, and it was for 25 yards. I brought up Andrews because on the play, um, both – uh, Frankie Louvu and, and Percy Butler go with Andrews to the flat. So the problem is that it creates an opening down, you know, in, over the middle. And that's where Jackson was targeted the, the defense. So on the play, the first mistake was that, and I talked, I talked to people about like, how should these coverage rules work? Basically you, you know, it looks like, a cover three match. So in that situation, you're going to have Percy Butler would be responsible if this is, you know, if, if the processing is right, correct. So you, you would anticipate the safety, I should say, and taking the tight end in that situation, the linebacker then has to drop. But the other thing is on that play, it's a cover three match. So the other corners, um, Sam still and St. Juice matching with their, their guy, you have a safety. And then you also have, um, no Igbenogany over on the left side. Well, his the guy that he should match with runs the deep crosser and he buzzes to the flat. So it looks like he's, but he's dropping to a landmark, whereas the other ones are playing the match principle. So there's just, that's something you can clean that up. And yet, even at the end of the play, you can kind of see Sam was still in, and, and um, Igbenogany kind of communicating with each other about whatever happened right so i think like that's something that again you can clean up because it's just a matter of like hey you're all in this coverage you know everybody else who's playing that zone match one guy wasn't so that you have to get corrected so it's not insurmountable to correct that play but it did happen and it led to a big play um sometimes it's a bad angle there's one time with sam still is covering uh, flowers coming across the middle and um you know there's a he start he starts to take an angle behind another receiver and defensive player the linebacker wagner and then he decides then he stops and kind of has to cut under so just a little bit of a delay as to how he needed to do it you can play that better and i you know one thing i know with sam stills i think he will get better because he's just he does what they need i mean he's doing he's playing outside and he's doing a pretty good job out there. And they, again, Quinn pretty much said again today, his best area is inside. They're having to play him outside. And I know, you know, it's funny because I know people will bring up Daryl Green to me. Daryl was 5'9". Daryl was had world-class speed and elite quickness. Sam still is still better suited inside. So 
just being five nine doesn't make you the same as, as somebody else. I you know, and I also know that they like the bigger corners in this defense. But but Sam is still again. I've always said it because of the way he competes, he can do things that others I don't think could. But again, that's a lesson he can learn. Is you know, you see this. This is how you got to play. It's just again, I've talked about Logan Paulson talking about this on his Take Command podcast with Craig Hoffman one time, where it's like sometimes you just have to go through things, even if it, it may be six, seven games into your career, and maybe you're seeing something or experiencing something different for whatever reason for the first time, whether this is that that example or not, you're going to say, oh, okay, see it on film. All right, now I know how to handle it. So there you go. Um, on the 33-yard quarterback run by Lamar Jackson, you have an angle that it looks like Jeremy Chin, does he take does he take too flat of an angle and not and because of that doesn't really attack it the way maybe they would want and then force it back inside. Also on that play, Frankie Lubu gets cracked by a tight end. Now, again, I talked to somebody who knows defense pretty well, who's like, what he would have told his guy in that situation when watching the film is play a little bit more over the the head of the tight end to take away that crack, the ability to crack down. Because you know, based on the positioning, that that or maybe, I can't remember if it was a tight end or receiver, but based on the positioning, you know that that's a possibility. So try to take that away just by um, by how you align and that puts you in a better spot to either help with the, with get it over there or to um, you know make the play yourself. But anyways, those are coaching points that I think are to me are interesting, and that way allows you to to avoid some of that um, that um, that those crack bats crackbacks. And so you know again, and then there were there were times where again I brought up St. Jude's. Yes, he was beaten on some plays too, and there was on the twenty seven yard run late in the game by Derrick Henry and the little toss who to the left, you see St. Juice running, the, he's on that side. They lost somebody. They didn't have enough guys on that side. Well, he's running back to the inside, but it looks like he's going with the receiver who was in the backfield and starting to kind of, it looked like he thought there was going to be some, the receiver was going to come back across the formation with the bootleg action, but he vacated it. And, and there was an opening for Derrick Henry. And there you go. So again, it was an overall there were a lot of things that went wrong to to build on to create those big plays, and you know it starts. You got to get a better pass rush, more consistent pass rush, and then I think the one thing I think to their benefit is you're not going to face a lot of offenses that are this dynamic and pose a threat the way they do in in the run game and the pass game, and that's an explosive run game for sure. So. I think they'll be they'll benefit from even if there are some teams that have good passing attacks. But if you can take away something, take away the run, they couldn't take away anything after a while. I think whether they got run down or not in the second half, whatever the reason was, they really they lost the ability to do that. And Baltimore is the kind of team that they're going to stick with the run because they know Derrick Henry or Lamar Jackson are going to break one at some point against almost every team, right? So, and that's pretty much what happened. So let's go to the offense now, because that's that's still the, and now let me say, last thing on the defense, there are things that they can, again, a part of the reason I'm talking about this too, is there are things they can do better. And there are things they can correct right now that they don't, yeah, we know they need another cornerback. That's an off season thing. You're, you know, unless you make some kind of a trade, the, the you know, that's an off season where you can really, really fix it right now you have to fix it with coaching and how they're not so much how they use but make sure they're all on that quote-unquote same page and the communication to be there there is there is one on another one where um if you remember late in the game there was um zone coverage and i want to remember this play let me find it real quick so it was a 17 yard pass to receiver and zone coverage and what the Ravens did well that confused them, they were in a bunch formation. They motioned the um, the inside, you know, you have the point guy and you have guy on the left, guy on the right. You motion the inside guy on, on the right, motion him outside. Well, that changes the rules or that changes the coverage for who's out there. And there was a little bit of mix-up because Igbenogany, I don't think, and, and he and Luvu basically went with the same guy. Now, Luvu does a good job of passing, to, running with the receiver, passing him off to the backside corner. Well, that left, and with Igbenogany, who's running with them too, and I think then realizes, turns around, and that's that's an area that where that guy was there. And it looks like, again, another sort of match principle. Um, and 
again, talking to somebody who knows defense, I, the rule for them would be that's, you know, that Igbenogany would have been on that guy. So that's something, again, that you can clean up, but he's got to get better in that, right? If, if that's indeed what happened, but there has to be some improvement there um, for sure, because you can't keep having these kind of breakdowns. It's one thing that I understand, pick your poison and you're devoting more guys to the box, but you're playing in coverage. You've got to get that right. And you've got to have some level of communication as well. And, you know, there was a 38 yarder to Mark Andrews where there, you could see Quan Martin going up. There was three of the receivers to the left going up and he's clapped and trying to draw attention to something. Not quite sure. That's something I want to ask him about when we get back in the locker room this week. But on the play, you could see like, you know, it looks like Lamar Jackson is reading Jeremy Chin on the play. He's kind of in the right side, almost, you know, not quite in the flat. You have Derrick Henry running out to the flat. It's a first down and 10. A lot of this damage came on first and 10, by the way, a lot of play action too. That was, they, they were, they knew how much Washington was devoting to trying to stop their run game. And they really, really played off that. So, but on this one, Chin, you know, it looks like Lamar reads him and, and Chin sees Derrick Henry. So he starts coming up and boom, it's an automatic over the top. But there were also just, there were a couple other things about that play that kind of looked funky. Like you had the, the corner on that side, taking his guy down the field. You have Quan Martin and Percy Butler were like a two deep. And you have Quan rotating to cover that outside corner. So it just, and it, you know, it looks, and you know, does, does Butler need to squeeze more on that backside and, you know, um, was the corner supposed to drop off to cover the cover that target and have Quan rotate to cover the other? A lot of questions on that one. So not I'm not assigning blame. I'm just telling you what you see on that play and then wondering what what it was. So, anyways, let's get back to the offense because again, that's the fun stuff. And you know, it's funny because one of the things that that jumps out too is just how well Zach Ertz at times uses his leverage. Not at times he does use his leverage very well. And there was one play. Whereas, um, let me let me check this one again to see how long it was. I believe it was for like a 12-yard game, but it was against the cornerback. And I bring this up because I remember when Jordan Reedy was here, man, he had a hard time. Once he started putting corners on him, he had a harder time with them despite his size. But part of what the coaches would say at the time is, you've got to attack their leverage. And so this is exactly what I saw from Zach Ertz on the play. He's running down the seam, corners got him outside leverage, just kind of stems a little bit to the outside, Cuts back to the inside, creates separation, 12-yard gain. Just a just savvy veteran play by Ertz. It's why he's still an effective player. Hey, it's Bram Weinstein here, voice of the commanders. And, of course, frequent guest of this podcast, The John Kime Report. I wanted to let you all know that my show, which airs at 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. on ESPN 630, is now exclusively produced by Empire Media, my company, and it's going to be distributed through our network. So I'm asking you, please, if you subscribe to this show and love this show, give mine a try as well. Subscribe to The Bram Weinstein Show wherever you get your podcasts. And many of the shows and many of the elements that are in the show will be available on the Empire Media YouTube channel. We're going to talk a ton of commanders and other DC sports. Check it out. Um, the Ravens did play a lot of zone coverage. Understandable when you have what you have in, in Jaden Daniels. They did not want him to hurt him with his legs. And he, he didn't hurt him with any long runs. He got a couple first downs with his legs. But he, and he didn't hurt with long ones. He did hurt him by extending plays. And man, is that kid good. Um, a couple key plays too. Like, listen, these are little plays. You know, little plays. This is not a little play. It's a second down and I think it was 12. But you had a pass to, to Olam, Olamide Zacchaeus at the 25-yard line. And he tries to turn up field way too fast rather than just catching, securing, getting the first down because it would have been a first down. But instead, he tries to get a field too fast, drops the ball, and then the next play is incomplete. Then they punt. So they were in position. The game's tied 3-3 at this point. So you're in position at least to, to take a lead on a, with a field goal, maybe even a touchdown. But that team, like the more you can do that, if you can start matching them or just getting ahead, man, does it, does it alter things a little bit. So that's something, you know, Zacchaeus has done a nice job this season. But that was a play where you absolutely know he would probably felt really bad and would love to have that back. Um, I also hear a lot about with 
You know, I think Brandon Coleman, still certainly I, there are a lot of good things that you see. There's also a lot of development still going on. And when you watch the the tackle play, like Cornelius Lucas, I think has done a good job. I think that there's, I think the road, they're still alternating in part because if you felt like um, Coleman was taking advantage or taking, just kind of seizing that job, I think they probably put him out there more, you know, I know as a starter, but it's still working the way it is, which is to be honest, it's kind of amazing. I don't know if I've ever seen a tackle rotation this long into a season, um, but Coleman does a nice job. He is athletic. He does have strong hands and all that. There were a couple of times I felt like he got in trouble the other day with just a little bit, you know, about a, not, almost a lunge, a little bit bending at the waist. But um, I do like where I, the kid can play. It's just, you know, so we'll see where, how that develops. I felt like the left tackle, I mean, just the line in general, there was some pressure. Alec Reddy had a couple issues. One time, though, it was like it's over three seconds before um, Dan, it was like th almost 3.2 seconds before Daniels really had to move. But the pressure came through, Ale the, pre the, the eventual pressure came through Alec Reddy. Um, and, you know, it, there were a couple of times it happened, but I think overall the line did pretty good. There was one time Coleman gave up a pressure where, it looked like they were in a stunt, but Alec Reddy stays with his man and Coleman's trying to go underneath to stay with his and it forces Daniel outside the pocket, but he was not sacked. So this is one of the benefits of a, of a quarterback like Daniels where you're not getting hurt by the pressures because the kid, because he can get out of it and it just, it helps everybody, man. And it makes the line feel better because they're, you know, and they, they I mean, it wasn't, well, whatever, the line's doing a good job. And there are a lot of clean pockets that he's that he's having to throw that he gets to throw from, as well. There was one time where where Deami Brown beats Wiggins down the side. He's one on one, didn't see him, but it was a see. I think oh, it was a third down and five, and Daniels ends up scrambling for a first down anyway. So it, no, you know, it didn't hurt him. But I think that's one where he looks like ah, oh, you know, you that's one where he's, you think you'd like another shot at that one because he's really good at taking advantage of those situations with any of these receivers. So um, yeah, there you go. Um, but what I also really like with Daniels is how well he gets his hips around on when he's on the move. And there was the one time where he sailed the pass to Noah Brown, even on that, when he gets it on, he's just on the move, maybe going a little bit quicker than he would, would ordinarily go, but he's, if he's not, he's going to get sacked, but by and large, he gets his, his gets it hips around his, he's squared the line. You know, it's funny because I was thinking about this. There are sometimes where I'm watching him in the pocket. It's like if you watch, all right, this might be a ridiculous comparison, but if you watch Steph Curry shoot, there's sometimes he gets a shot off so quick, like how the hell did that go in? And then you slow it down by frame and you realize that at the moment of release, how square he is to the basket and what a good shooting form is in that moment. And when you watch Jade Daniels sometimes, he had a couple of throws like, how is he making that so accurate given like the second touchdown pass to Terry McLaurin? I'm going to get that in a minute, but like he's drifting back and it's like his feet. It's just, they're, they're both pointing toward the goal line. Like it's, it's a difficult throw and he's so, it was so damn accurate, but in that moment, you get your body, right? Your shoulder square, you know, to the, to the target, just a really nice job that he does all the time. And it's funny because Dan Quinn even told us today, I'm going to try and find these quotes for you. So hold on one second. What he said about Jaden Daniels and and then some of the, um, the passes that he had and what he said about it. Um, he said there, are, let's see, let me read what, what we find here because it was really good. Okay, so I found it, folks. So one of the things that Quinn said is that the football intelligence, the football intelligence that he brings is really strong. And I think you consistently see that. And he's like, there are times where he's not just making a good throw, but a really smart quarterback play. And just, he said, he felt like he was fitting it into, he said, um, some of the best rips of his season actually happened yesterday on some tight window throws. So I would agree with that. Like the more, and when I went back and watched it after the Quinn presser, Man, did it really? Yeah, I thought that I thought there were a lot of really good throws yesterday, but after listening to Quinn, it's like, yep, there, there's this one, there's this one, there's this one, and so I'm going to put up some examples of that for you guys on YouTube. But man, there were a lot of examples. There was a deep, there was an out to Noah Brown on a third down, I believe it was that he gets for 11 yards and just a first down. If you don't put it right on the on the money, the guy's right there in tight coverage. I think one of my favorite throws. Was a fourth it was a third down throw. It was third and I think it was um, third and six to McLaurin. 
runs an eight, he gets a, catches an eight yard pass. But I'm putting this one up uh, as a picture. Look at where McLaurin is when Daniels is starting to throw the ball. That ball's coming out. McLaurin is not even out of his break. He's not, he hasn't even turned around yet. The defensive back is right on him. He's got if that ball if 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 um, Daniels hesitates at all or doesn't throw it right then that ball's not that ball's not completed. But because he does and he puts it low into the outside, man, does he give McLaurin a shot? And you know I think this is where that chemistry is coming, and it's also the um, the trust that that is built that he he knows where it's going but he knows he's got to get out there right now is just such a smart man folks enjoy enjoy this young man because it's fun watching him for sure so you got that one then there's a um the, oh my goodness the 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 third and 10 to to Ertz over the middle for 12 yards to the one yard line before the last touchdown it's just incredible because you've got a guy who's sitting right in front of Ertz, but he throws it just enough to the inside to lead Ertz into the catch and just out of the outstretched hands of the defender. I mean, that that's a ballsy throw that you had to make in that situation. It's just really, really good. And then you have the touchdown pass to McLaurin. I went over it yesterday after the game about the whole machinations of the play and how McLaurin and he got on the same page. But look at the throw. Not only he pumps it, but he, you know, the pump didn't really sell the defensive back because McLaurin was already starting to run the fade. But but it also required now more time to get the ball to to McLaurin. And the rush is break, breaking down on him. And his feet, he's not able to get his feet pointed to the target. So he got him kind of to the line, but the shoulders get square. And he's having to drift back a little bit. And he throws it a dime to the back shoulder where only McLaurin can get it. I mean, again, I watch these guys, these quarterbacks, every Friday they're throwing, their, one of the drills they do is throw the ball in the bucket in the corner of the end zone in the garbage can. And he, I don't think I've ever seen him do it. And my goodness, in a game does he drop in sometimes. And that was just another one. There was the pass to McLaurin down the sideline on the fake receiver screen to, to Zacchaeus where McLaurin just releases down the sideline in between coverage, there's a gap and he gets drilled, but it's a, it's a good throw. And, and it's a good concept because Noah Brown holds that corner back there on that side, or excuse me, the safety on that side, because it was Kyle Hamilton. He holds him because the route he's running down the field creates that opening and just a good throw. So a lot of examples, a smart play too. And it came up after the game, but it also, I meant to point it out, but it's, a, and it's just because it's a small play but a savvy play where he bounces the pass to Eckler before halftime that with I think it was like 20 seconds left that, you know, if you complete that pass, it's a little valve. He's just, you know, just a check down to him. But if you complete it, you're going to get tackled and now, and you're not getting any yards. It was not worth the completion to do that. So he skipped it to him just to get rid of the ball, avoid a sack and then keep it in a better down and distance situation. So just a smart play. And, you know, I think that's why you can remain, despite the loss, you can still feel good about, about where this team is headed because of how he plays. And despite the injury to John Allen, because of how number five plays and the approach, I think this team takes game after game. I think that's, I, you have to see it Sunday. This is a big game for that reason, but I think you see it. And again, enjoy number five folks. Cause he's special. All right. That's it for me. Um, I'll be back again Tuesday night with Bram Weinstein, the voice of the commanders. Hopefully my voice is back. We'll see. But 7.30 Eastern time with the live stream. Join us then. Apologize for kind of rambling on a little bit here for going longer. I appreciate you sticking with me. I'll talk to you next time.